This is the headset. Okay. And that allows us to determine where in the head oxygen is changing to understand disease state and treatment. Okay. Welcome to Startup Health TV, where we celebrate the entrepreneurs and the innovators who are transforming health. I'm Logan Plaster with Ryan Field here, CEO of Kernel. Ryan, great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you, Logan. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, we talked in, was it July in Philadelphia at AAIC? Yes, we had a, a nice hot walk, uh, an outdoor interview at AIC. Yes, now you can be in my studio here. Uh, it's been exciting to see uh, your progress. You're a recent uh, addition to the Alzheimer's moonshot, well, not so over the last few months, um, but you've, you've spent years on this new product of yours, which, which I want to talk about. How long have you been working on the Kernel, what do you call it? Yeah, it's called the Kernel Flow. The Flow. So it's a, we call it a headset, not a helmet, because helmet it makes it seem like you're going to protect yourself from something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a headset's something you wear and does something on your head. And how long have you been working on that technology? Yeah, so I've been working on it for about six years now. Okay. I joined in 2018 at Kernel to start developing the chips, the integrated circuits that power the measurement. Okay. Uh, and... It, um, it's taken a lot of effort, long nights, you know, crunching numbers, doing all kinds of things to build this first of its kind uh, type of measurement system. We went through four iterations of uh, you know, technology de design and prototypes. Our first one was like the size of a room. No way. Had all these like fibers coming down and like okay. you can just imagine like someone hooked up with all these like Thing EMG had wires going yeah room and so that's where we started a Marvel movie uh, and you know five years later we're uh, we're here okay. and we have it all in a headset okay and uh, we've been using it for about 12 months 18 months in clinical research so in clinical practice uh, psychiatry and neurology offices where patients are coming in to be assessed or treated we're also getting them measured so we can start to understand what are the signatures of brain activity that relate to their illness and treatment? Okay, so what does it actually look like? You said it looks like... Well, I brought one for you. Oh, well, hello. Oh. Um, oh, well, it's beautiful. This is the headset. Okay. So uh, this was the, the... Flow. This is the Kernel Flow. Kernel Flow. Okay. Um, and um, we can see... Hold you it. can hold it. You won't break it. Okay. I challenge you. Sort of. Okay. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that challenge. But I'm looking inside and there are... How many of those little not you know sensor? So there are forty of these optical modules. Okay. Uh, and each optical module has three lasers okay. and six sensors. Okay. Uh, and what we do is we pulse laser light into the head and we measure how long it takes to come out. So we're measuring nanosecond time scales of light passing through the head, and that allows us to um, determine where um, in the head oxygen is changing. And what we really care about is being able to identify the oxygen that's changing in the brain so we can then map it. So we have so many of them because we create these dense maps okay. of activity in the brain and use those dense maps to understand disease state and treatment. Okay. okay, this looks really cool. It also looks really expensive. Why wouldn't I just go and get like a MRI or a fMRI? Yeah, so this um, not only costs uh, much less, so this is like... Um, a hundred times less than an MRI. It looks fancier than maybe like the technology. Uh, well, it's very complicated, complicated, fancy technology. In terms of how expensive it is to make. Yeah. So we, I mean. we built it around a consumer electronics supply chain. Got it. So actually the sensors that are used in this, um, the system to measure these uh, times, they're very similar to the sensors that are used in your iPhone to do the, um, like some of their autofocusing techniques. So they're, okay. they have LiDAR sensors in the camera. And that was from, uh, that was by design. You wanted to use a consumer product sort of, you said a uh, supply chain, yeah. so that things were scalable. scalable. Got exactly. it, got it. Because uh, one of the things that we felt that's held back brain measurement is the ability to scale it. And the other big difference from fMRI is that I can carry this with me, but also it can be used in a real clinical setting. I see it kind of flexes. Yeah, and so I had adjust to the different head sizes. It's got a little like knob, just like a bike helmet. So you can, got it, okay. You can adjust. So you say it's actually cheaper than an MRI, a functional MRI. Yeah. It's more scalable. And so what does life look like in the community, in the world, when more people can get this kind of brain scan? Yeah, I mean, so the vision is that we kind of take a, advantage of its scalability so that it can come to the patients. So rather than being referred out to like a specialist imaging center, we can have this like eventually in everyday clinical practice. You know, you go to the doctor today, and I think we've talked about this in the past, 
there are no measures for the brain that they use. You go to your primary care, and this is their measure of your uh, yep. cognitive abilities. Can you talk to me? And they have about the same amount of time, like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> this is like a, you know, a doctor's assessment of your brain health. Yeah. Uh, and we think that should really change. And we think that this is a type of tool that has uh, universal enough applicability across disease states that you could, you know, in principle, use it to screen for many different things, so, including yeah. Alzheimer's. Okay, so I'm a primary care doctor. I'm guessing I would like lease one of these or something. You know, I wouldn't want to have to keep fixing it or whatever. So I at least one of these, I'd have it in my office. Is that the vision? Yeah, exactly. And I, can, I can, patient can use it. How long does it take? It takes about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Data goes into the cloud or does the primary care doctor assess it from there? So we build the algorithm. So the primary care doctor isn't burdened with you know, interpreting all these complex data as we build the algorithms. It's a we kind of like AI data first play where we give them the results. So we give them a set of scores uh, related to the brain health or activity. And that's what they would use to make their own clinical decisions. We're not going to, you know, make them learn uh, complex new technologies and, sure. you know, have to get a, a new degree in interpreting data yeah. in order to take advantage of this. So we're making it uh, simple, fit in with their like existing frameworks of of understanding patients. Uh, how many people have tested this thing out? Yeah, so we've tested, um, close to a thousand people have been measured with this. We are uh, running uh, studies in eight different clinics today. So psychiatry and neurology centers. Okay, wow. And our initial focus isn't on primary care, it's on the specialist care. So we want to start in specialist the care. Neurology office. Neuro neurology, neuropsychiatrists, people who have a need to you know, have better measures for what their patients are going through. Uh, and then starting from the specialist care, moving upstream into primary care eventually, right? So once you prove it out in the specialist care, you can add value to their workflow. You can start to look for other ways to expand within primary care. But we see a real opportunity in, especially in like um, uh, diagnosis for Alzheimer's, right? Like uh, today, a primary care may flag someone. Well, a screening test says like, hey, this person has things to be concerned about. They then get a referral to a specialist. Yeah. That referral can take six to 12 months. Uh, and then that specialist does a multi-hour uh, cognitive assessment on them, yep. which is part of the reason it takes so long to get an appointment um, before coming to a, a, a diagnosis decision. Before then maybe sending them out for a PET scan or a lumbar puncture or whatever. Right. And so what we want to do is try and shrink the amount of time that that cognitive test takes while giving them the same information. So the, and it can be as accurate as all of that? Yeah, it can be as accurate. And that's what some of our preliminary data has shown. So the, the study we finished over the summer that we talked about at AIC, uh, that, um, that's really given us the, the energy to keep kind of pushing down this path and show what we can do to try and improve the workflow for patients that are uh, suspected of having Alzheimer's. And you said about a thousand people have tried it. Any pushback, like I'm nervous about lasers? pointed at my head any concerns no and every time it comes up like my favorite uh one liner is you can buy more dangerous lasers on amazon as cat toys okay so you can buy a class three laser on amazon well little lasers just are just not the type that they're just not dangerous they're, they're, they're not like dangerous. not focused they're very low energy yeah. like it's just enough so that we can get the measurement and cause no harm okay yeah. okay and, and and that's allowed you to um, get this through sort of regulation as a, as a safe device. So we're able to use it in research settings as a safe device today. Uh, and then we have our, our separate path through the FDA working on uh, getting approval for the claims, the diagnostic and support claims that we're making. And what's the timeline for that? I think a few years out uh, before we get it fully approved and through the, the regulatory pathway, but we're working on it today. So it's uh, it's a process, as uh, you might expect. It's a hardware device. Yeah. Uh, it's new. It's uh, very complicated, a lot of data coming out. So it, it takes a lot to kind of bring something like this into market. Uh, it's not as easy as just like writing this new software and getting a 510K and using a device that's been around for decades. So. But in that challenge, you create a moat and you create opportunity. So it's very exciting. I mean, and honestly, like here at Health, like the, the theme is be bold, right? Uh, and like being bold isn't doing something easy. That just takes a couple months, right? Being bold is like seeing something, committing to a vision and really pushing forward. It took millions of dollars of R&D. Took tens of millions of dollars. Tens of millions of dollars of R&D. And like that was a bold move by our founder to start this company and really like say, we need something like this in the world. And now we're trying to kind of move forward with that bold vision and say like, not only have we built this technology, it can do some really important, valuable things for patients, providers, and payers. Like we can make the whole system work better with, uh, with measurement. And you made it beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. I, I can't take credit for making it beautiful. 
Um, uh, we have great designers on the team who've done uh, fantastic work. To, uh, That's part of what helps it scale and grow. Yeah, you want it. You want it to be approachable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's approachable from the outside at least. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Well, R Ryan, thanks for showing it to me and giving me the update. Uh, you didn't have this with you when we were in uh, AAIC in Philly. No. I, I didn't get to see it then, so I'm glad to see it now. And anytime you want to get your brain measured, let me know. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Great. Thanks for a good.